Okay, uh, I think uh, we'll get started and people will trickle in as, uh, as they will. Um, I'm uh, Ani Adhikari, I teach statistics at Berkeley and I thank you so much for coming here. Uh, there are many, many options for you to choose from. I'm very delighted you're here. That's why some of you I know have flights to catch very soon. Um, the reason I am standing up here, uh, I'll try to make clear by explaining uh, my connection with MOOCs. Uh, at Berkeley, we have a, an introductory statistics course called Statistics 2. There is no Statistics 1, I don't know why. Um, it is a semester-long, 15-week course, and it, is, um, it satisfies uh, what is called Berkeley's breadth requirement. It satisfies the quantitative reasoning requirement for graduation. Uh, it is taken not only by people who are you know, wanting a quantitative course for graduation, but a lot by pre-med people. Uh, it is a course with very little mathematics. So it is a statistics course with almost no mathematics. And uh, the, the prerequisite we say is high school algebra, and that is a code for I will not write a summation sign on the blackboard. <laughs> right? I try to avoid X as much as possible, um, because one of the things we are trying to do is to not get lost in algebra or not to use the algebra as a shield uh, and to rather to get to, you know, ex talking about what the ideas actually mean. So that's stat two, and uh, I decided that I would uh, turn that into a MOOC, and uh, a little bit more of my motivation I'll talk about in a minute. So uh, stat two got transformed into stat two X on edX, uh, and because I was imagining this student motivating himself or herself through a statistics course, you know, in some location far away, I thought that would be a very difficult thing to do for 15 weeks. Um, and so I broke it into three five-week segments. So, and the material naturally breaks uh, in that way. And there's a couple of weeks gap between each at the end of every five weeks. Uh, if they uh, complete, they get a certificate. And I, I think it really keeps people going because there's a very short tunnel, and you can see the uh, light at the end of it the minute you enter. Uh, so we did three five-week segments, and I was quite honest about the prerequisite. I simply called it arithmetic, and specifically, arithmetic meant if you understand that 1 over 2 is the same as 0.5 is the same as 50%, you are in. If you understand that 1 third is not the same as 30%, you are ahead of the game. Right, so that's the class, and I had a specific reason for this uh, level of prerequisite, uh, partly because it is sort of commensurate with what we do in, uh, in STAT 2, and I wanted to adhere to the principles of UC Berkeley X, with which I agree, which is that we should teach the Berkeley course, not somehow watered down for a general audience, but the Berkeley course. So just to be consistent with that, and for other reasons which I'll talk about in a minute, that was the prereq, and so, here they are. These three courses, you can find them on edX, those are the three logos. Uh, five weeks of descriptive statistics, five weeks of probability theory, and then another five weeks of putting the two together into statistical inference, the basic stats uh, from starting with nothing uh, to ending up with being able to, uh, I hope, read the summary of a statistical analysis uh, in a paper. Um, and that ran twice. Um, in spring 2013 and spring 2014. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about what happened. So first I'll tell you why I did it. And uh, the practical reason is I did it because Armando Fox, who was sitting here uh, about half an hour ago, uh, came up to me and said, hey, how about a MOOC? We've got uh, edX going and you know, we, he was director of Berkeley X at the time and I didn't think too hard, and that is the principal reason that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought for five more minutes, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, but what was inside, what was making me do it, I, are primarily three things. Uh, and the first was this. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. You've all heard it. And you don't hear, it's attributed to Mark Twain, he may or may not have said it. Anyway, everybody else says it. Uh, you don't hear lies, damn lies, and physics. 
you don't hear lies, damn lies, and even economics. But you hear lies, damn lies, and statistics. And why do you hear that? It is because people read stuff, and they sort of don't understand, and that makes them very resentful and suspicious. They read stuff that is just flat out wrong, and they know that it's wrong, and therefore they know it's lies. And it's numerical, and they attribute that to the subject. But what's happening, of course, is that the subject is being used and is being read by people who have no idea what they're reading. And so here was my chance to do for the world what I do routinely in Stat 2 in Berkeley, uh, uh, following the footsteps of other faculty in my department, David Friedman in particular, um, to demystify to lift the fog from statistics. And statistics labors under a thick fog um, and is one of the more poorly taught subjects in the world. And so this was my chance. Uh, and I grabbed it. And uh, just to give you a sense, without taking up too much time, of how I teach, uh, my, I feel that in any statistical analysis there are three parts. There's a scientific problem, there's the question, and that generates the assumptions under which you are allowed to work. That's part one. Part two is once you've decided what you're gonna do, there's the calculation. And then part three is understanding what the numbers mean that you have calculated, the interpretation of the mathematics or the arithmetic that you've done. And the typical statistics course will focus on part two on the calculation. Here, compute this. This is a standard deviation, compute this, right? Perform a t-test. Well, great, but a machine can do that. You don't actually need a human intelligence, right? You can just go into R and type t-test and it will pop a number. What you need our brains for is parts one and three. And so my class focuses on one and three. And I make part two as easy as possible. And uh, that is uh, something that, was, uh, that I learned from uh, David Friedman in particular. There are very few people who can genuinely claim to have transformed the way a subject is taught. David Friedman of Berkeley could legitimately have done that. Uh, his uh, statistics textbook written with Roger Purvis and uh, Robert Pisani came out in the 1970s. It's simply called Statistics and it is perhaps one of the greatest introductory textbooks in any subject anywhere. Um, so there was that, demystifying it. And second is, uh, I think you can guess that I uh, come from India. Um, and I remember very clearly being among large groups of very bright young people, frustrated because the materials at our hands were so paltry. Uh, and the teaching was, you know, people were doing their best, but, you know, it was kind of, much of it was kind of routine, and we just had this sense that if only somebody would talk to us, uh, that we could fly. And this was a way for me to give back. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to participate in giving uh, anybody in the world a high-quality learning experience for free. Um, and so that meant something to me, and I did that. And, when, and, and you know, I say to students everywhere, and really it's, it is almost everywhere. There are, by most counts, about 196 countries in the world, you know, give or take a few countries where some people can't decide whether they're a country or not. But roughly, roughly uh, uh, 195 or so, among my students are represented 186 of those countries. Right? That is really a worldwide reach. Um, and that was a privilege, so I took that. And the third is uh, there's numerical information everywhere. Everywhere, you keep hearing big data, well, little data is all around you and has been forever. And it is very, very important, I think, for people to be able to make sense of data. And so um, um, I, I wanted to uh, develop students who would look at numerical information in an intelligent manner uh, who would be able to read a statement in the newspaper that said researchers at the University of California at Berkeley have developed, uh, have discovered a highly significant link between this and that, and have some sense of what that means, and know what questions to ask, what is missing in that article, 
um, what might have gone wrong, what is probably a takeaway from that article, to read that intelligently, to be able to understand why uh, uh, opinion polls can be based on 0.1% of a population and still be accurate. That kind of thing, the, the standard numerical stuff that you see everywhere, I wanted people to have some real a solid sense of what is behind that. That is my main motivation for teaching STAT2 and uh, 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 STAT2X. And so I did it that way. By the way, this format that I'm using, this blue and gold, this is exactly what my students see uh, in my MOOC. Um, I was uh, very conscious of the uh, perils of distraction. So you heard this morning, don't distract your students. So I don't have my face showing on the screen. There is, uh, at the start of a section, I appear and I talk for a bit, but this is what they see. Um, and by focusing my mind on the student's experience, I, I deliberately didn't have myself videoed doing my lectures because that's not the student's experience. The student is not in a room with 300 people listening to a lecture. The student is by himself or herself in their own room, possibly at one o'clock in the morning with headphones on. And so it is a one-to-one -one con conversation between me and the student, so I forced myself to recognize that this is me, not in lecture, so I did not throw my voice, which is what I do in lecture, but I spoke to my microphone as though it was a student sitting across the desk from me. And that method has worked very, very well. The students somehow felt that there was a connection, even though they didn't have uh, the, the face. And so as a result of all of this, and I'm sure with some good luck, it went down well. Um, I would say anywhere between 70,000 at a conservative estimate to 90,000 people in its two runs. Um, a completion rates, I mean, if you're going to measure success by completion rates, which you've heard uh, here, and I agree with, is not the right measure to use, uh, were high. I mean, the typical completion rate, 5 to 7 percent for one of these large MOOCs, and we were doing anywhere between 10 to 17 percent. Um, I don't like that measure, so I won't harp on it. But students liked it, and uh, there was a lot of demand for the next course. And that's all fine. Um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. But you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And so there was a consequence. And the consequence was Armando Fox walking into my office again about this time last year and saying, we'd like to run it three times a year. And I froze. And this talk is uh, born out of my sheer cold terror at hearing those words. Because, you know, there's a good thing, the students like it, and he wants to do it again and again and again because we feel that we can teach the course by pushing a button. Right? It's right there. Go again. And I, being the person who actually did it, had a sort of freak out moment, and I realized very clearly that I did not want to do it again and again. I certainly wanted to do it twice. You want to fix the goof ups the first time. And I may, after a gap, want to do it again, but I do not want to do it continuously. I didn't sign up for that. Nobody would want to do it continuously. And so, how would I help edX keep its program going because they want to run the class? And so we get into what were the obstacles for me teaching it again. And the first one was I've got a paid job. I'm employed full-time by the University of California, and you know they're not paying me to do this. This was over and above, and there's only so much you can do over and above, and that was one of the questions raised just about an hour earlier in the same room, I think by you. Right? It's an important question. Right? How do we keep sustaining this enterprise? Um, and universities need to make up their minds about what their mission is. I think it's an important mission, at least at the introductory level, to get good introductory materials out there for the world. If nothing else, it helps teachers. Um, it gives teachers a um, uh, resource that was not easily available before. It gives teachers a resource all over the world. I think we have a responsibility, but that is, you know, at the moment, still a subject of some discussion. I have a job. Even if I didn't have that job, I do have other things I want to do. Right? There's, I mean, the world is not limited to STAT2. There are many other wonderful things that I want to do, and even if I had 
no other job, and no other interests, I firmly believe in the following. The world does not need to keep hearing from me. Right? It is very important to have a multiplicity, a plurality of voices. And so I'm sitting there thinking, OK, so then what, how do we make this work? And I had to think about, OK, so what actually is involved in me teaching this course? That's how I started. What's involved in me teaching this course again? Um, and so there is basic course admin that we have to do. Anytime we teach a course, there's some, you know, you set up what's the schedule, when are the tests, when, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of laid out in the package that is already developed, but, you know, if it was laid out for spring 2014 and you're teaching it in fall 2016, you have to do a little date adjustment. You have to decide whether you want the quizzes to count for 40% or 30%, all of that kind of thing that you have to do. Fine, that everybody has to do that. Um, and that's the nitty gritty. Um, what does it mean to actually teach? And if MOOCs have done anything, they have really shone a spotlight on an inequality that we have been hearing over and over again at this conference, and that's this one. Teaching is not equal to delivering course materials. And so the delivery of the course materials, in some sense, was already done. And so then what did teaching mean? Well, teaching to me, no matter what, even when I'm standing up in front of 300 students in a class, it is not me, it, teaching doesn't flow this way. Teaching flows both ways. Teaching is a partnership, it's a collaboration between the students and me. And the course is not something I offer. I don't use that verb, offering a course, because it feels like it's going this way. But it's something that the students and I uh, create together. So I tell my students, you're not in my class to listen to a lecture, you're here to roll up your sleeves and work with me. Um, and so the teaching is what happens when the students and the teacher can hear each other. And so when does that happen in a MOOC? Well, at some level it happens during the exercises. You ask them to do something. Uh, they do it. It comes back. And edX sends them back a green check mark or a red cross. Now, that is communication of a sort. You really hope that communication doesn't end there. Um, and what's really bad about that communication, that really lacking in that communication, is you know what happens when a student comes to you in office hours and they've done something and it's not quite working out and you're talking to them and you tell them, no, 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 but think about this. What do they do? They say, no, but, but, but I thought it was going to be like this. And what that gr green check mark and red cross do, though they give feedback, is they don't give the student the opportunity to go, but, but, but. They don't give the student the opportunity to argue. They have to argue with you. And so when does that happen? It happens in one place in an edX course, and it happens in the discussion forum. And the critical back and forth, I hear the students in the discussion forum. And so leading that discussion forum, I believe, is the key to what I call reteaching a MOOC. I'm not developing the materials, but I'm teaching the MOOC, communicating with the students, hearing them. That's the job. Well, so if I look at that, if that is the job of teaching, and delivering course materials, this thing up here, is a different thing and has already been done, that means these two things don't have to be done by the same person. And so then very clearly, you've got another partnership going. You've got the person who developed the course materials, and you've got the person who actually does the teaching. They don't have to be the same person. At the moment, uh, the way edX is set up, the instructor of the course the name of the instructor is uh, the person who developed the course. There are other instructors, perhaps. But that person is always called the instructor, the person who developed the course. I don't want to be ever, in any course, just a nominal instructor. I don't want to be a name. So what I would like is to be called the author of the course. And so what I'm suggesting is that we take a look at something that we understand quite well, familiar ground. In a traditional course, you've got an instructor who does, of course, the course admin and then works with the students and in two places, in the lectures and outside the lectures. We're also used to having an author of a course textbook. That's a different person. That's the person students never see. That's the person in the background somewhere. They've provided course materials in mathematics classes. That text usually contains a set of exercises. What I'm saying is let's take a look at the MOOC 
And in the MOOC, what happens is this traditional course instructor gets split into two people. There's a person who handles the course administration and does the real teaching with the students outside of lectures. And then there's the person who delivers the course material. And in our minds, the instructor has been so inextricably linked to lectures that I think it's time to separate that. So what I'm saying is we split the traditional instructor into possibly two people, could be the same person, but into possibly two people, and then you have the third person, the author of the textbook, who is still there. And the author of the course in a MOOC is much more present than the author of the textbook, because the author of the course is either visible in the video lectures or at least audible in the video lectures. They're much more human than the author of a textbook is. So these two people are uh, people that the students meet. But it's this person, the instructor, with whom the students can speak. Uh, and if we just use this model, then I think it allows a person like me to create a MOOC, teach it a couple of times, and then just walk away from it and have Armando and Anand and other people use those materials with possibly somebody else teaching as many times as they want, as many times as they can get people to teach the class um, in just the same way as uh, you would uh, write a textbook. And then people all over the world use it. And so it doesn't limit edX, and it doesn't tie a millstone around my neck forever. And so I would hope very much that all of the uh, platforms would consider this model. And uh, what I'd like to look at now is, does it matter who teaches it? Um, and so now my MOOC has been put in quotes because you know, I did a part of it, but the actual teaching, I hope, would be done uh, by somebody else. So does it matter? Well, who does it matter to do edX? I hope not much, right? If students register for the course and if the instructor does a fine job, it should not matter to edX that it's me or somebody else. Um, edX should speak for themselves here, but I, I really feel that that is a, a reasonable um, expectation. Does it matter to me? Well. As far as I'm concerned, uh, creating the course is off the order of having written a textbook, right? Having created some course materials, if I had written a traditional textbook, then hopefully, if it's any good, I would not be the only person in the world who, only who used it. It would be used at universities all over the place. I would not even know who is using it, right? There would be some uh, buddy would adopt it. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's very similar to that. I don't, I, I don't feel tied to my MOOC. Does it matter to the students? I don't know. Uh, my guess is, again, if the instructor is doing a good job, it should not matter to the students. After all, Resnick and Halliday wrote a great physics, text, physics textbook decades ago. It's being used now. Are the students distraught because it's not Resnick and Halliday teaching them? I hope not because there's significant problems with <laughs> Resnick and Halliday are not around to teach them anymore. <laughs> no, they love the book. So I don't think it will matter to students, but will their reactions differ depending on whether it's the author of the course or um, an instructor at a different university from the person who is the author of the course or a graduate student? Well, if it's being done well, I think not, but I think not is not a good enough answer. So what we're doing currently is we are attempting to run a randomized control experiment. Run the course, split the forum, and have the different bits of the forum run by different types of people in different ways, and see if there's any effect on student learning. And um, it's an ongoing experiment. I had hoped to have uh, the second run of the course just ended a month ago. Uh, I had hoped to have some data for you, but what happened was that we discovered that the experiment was not so easy to do. Um, and because it's a little digression from the main points that I want to make, um, I will not discuss right now what the issues are with the experiment, other than to say that it's been a rocky road, but we're smoothing it out. Uh, once we are uh, done with this, if you have questions and are interested, I will be very happy to discuss what happened with the experiment and what we are trying, what we are trying to fix. Uh, in the end, I do have, uh, you know, um, 
Susan Singer yesterday had so many gems in her uh, keynote that it is actually very hard to focus on one part of a talk and let anything else go. One of the things she said was qualitative analyses are as important as quantitative analyses. And I have a very clear qualitative sense from the students that uh, it will not matter to them, that it is not matter much to them, that it is not the author of the talk, uh, not the author of the course who is uh, doing uh, their, uh, the communication as long as they learn. Um, so whether or not it matters to the students, I think it will not matter much. Uh, mattering to edX, what does it mean for the instructor to do a good job? And I would actually like to focus on this because teaching tens of thousands of students well does have a few things that you have to take care of. Um, and so this is my view on what it means to do a good job teaching at least my MOOC. And so the first is, and this people will look at this and go, well, it's course administration. Clarity, consistency, policies, schedules, expectations, course engineering that is consistent with your policies and uh, expectations, and you know, this is a no-brainer. However, it's not easy to do. Those of us who have taught classes, in-person classes with hundreds of students know that it is not easy to do. It is not easy to maintain over a period of 15 weeks. And the more students you have, every time you make a goof up that is administrative, the more dramas you cause, the more anxiety there is, and with the MOOC, Unlike your face-to-face -face course, where students are registered and they need that for credit, with the MOOC, they signed up for it because they signed up for it. They will drop out. And so making the course run smoothly acquires an importance even beyond the importance that it has uh, in face-to-face -face classes. This simple little thing, don't annoy the students because of logistical nonsense. Is, becomes very, very important. So that is an important part of running a course well. And you know, I'm sorry to belabor what seems like uh, an obvious point. Um, and then it's the instructor's job to welcome students in. At the beginning, the day the course starts, the instructor, I feel, needs to be present and say hello, bring them in, and to explain to them the importance of their communicating in the forum. And uh, one of the things I tell them is that on campus, my students see me. They see me at coffee shops. They see me wandering around. When I walk into lecture, I will say, oh, could you believe the traffic on Hearst Avenue? You know, they see me as a human being, whereas in uh, uh, the MOOC, they see me talking about statistics. And yes, I have picked lively examples, and yes, I have a sense of humor and so on, but you know, they're still kind of removed from me as the human being. And so I tell them that it is difficult for me to teach unless I'm seeing human beings. It is very difficult to teach the generic, absent, invisible student. And so to make my job easier and to make you know, me do a better job for them, would they please join in the forum? And once you do that, and once they start coming in, they encourage each other, but that initial Availability is quite important. And with a MOOC like Statistics 2, 186 countries, age group ranging, I believe, from 11 to over 70, uh, middle school students, retired people, neurosurgeons, radiotherapists, uh, psychologists, mathematicians, people wanting to learn machine learning, um, and people just wondering what on earth this subject is about and the big group of people who hated every minute of it when they took it, right? They hated it, but you know, they really need it for something and they're gonna give it one last try. That is a big and varied group. And being able to talk to them, all of them, and make all of them feel included, that is a difficult task and that is a primary thing that you need to do a, a good job. And you have to do it in writing. You gotta do it in written English to people who have no English. This is not trivial. And one of the things that uh, always trips me up is humor. Because I have this slightly you know, laid back style and every now and then I'll crack a joke and people say this, that I say off the wall things that make them wake up. Fine, but off the wall can be, uh, humor is very culture dependent. And so off the wall can be pretty difficult. And one of the, my problems to do with picking chocolates out of a box, there's dark chocolates and white chocolates and uh, uh, milk chocolates and you're know, picking at random and then what's the chance that 
uh, the 12th person who picks has a dark chocolate. And people write in because I have forced them to think about the assumptions they write in saying, okay, uh, is it with replacement or without replacement? So I shoot back, it's chocolates. Of course it's without replacement, I'm eating them. And the discussion forum goes haywire. Wait, who's eating the chocolates? Chocolates, it doesn't say it's being eaten. What, 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 who, 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 what's being eaten? Did you eat the, oh my, I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. But you know, you do want to be able to have a lighthearted conversation with a, a globe full of people. It's a difficult thing to do. Um, and I will say, you've got to handle the flames. You have to set the tone and you have to lead. Um, so please imagine the student in their own room uh, sitting and sending you essentially email and know what happens to perfectly nice people when they send email, when they're upset. They turn into Godzilla. Yeah, they're sitting by themselves. It's like when they are in a car, right? There is no inhibition, there is no community around them and they just fire something off. And it is the instructor's job to come in very calmly and deal with it. Know when not to engage, but also to you know, enforce the same kind of communication that there would be in your office. So this is a difficult thing, but all of these need to be done. I am not the only person in the world who can do this. Lots of people can do this. They don't have to be at Berkeley. And so I would hope that there's a large number of people who are possible instructors for my course. <coughs> what does it matter to me? I said, it's comparable to writing a textbook, and here I just want to be very clear about what it means, and I want to point to something that was asked uh, about an, uh, now an hour and a half ago here. Comparable to writing a textbook. So, here's my author's bill of rights. I'm not a rebel. I'm not doing anything dramatic here. I'm just saying some things that I think are obvious. First, I want to have my own copy, and I don't. Uh, I somewhere, I'm sure I can extract my course. It's not given to me as a normal thing. I think it just ought to be. I ought to have a soft copy of the entire thing. Because if edX decides to pull the plug, maybe I can do something with it. I wrote it, so I ought to be able to do something with it. This is obvious. Uh, and this, I think, is just purely easily, easily taken care of. The second, I want the integrity of my work preserved. If you look at a book, uh, people can use it uh, in classes, they can use any portion of it, they can use other books to supplement it, they can make nasty comments about the book, they're all free to do all that. But what they can't do is get inside the book and write other things in between your paragraphs. They can't get inside the book and delete portions of the book. The book exists as an object. I would like the course materials to exist as an object. And others not able to modify it without my permission. I might be fine with them modifying it, but I would like to have the option to say no. And let me say why I am saying this. I am extremely, extremely conscious as a teacher of elementary statistics that uh, what Kathy Castley was referring to the other day, that if you have lots of materials out there, the cream will rise to the top, the community will select the best materials. I sat there and I sighed because my reaction to that was, oh, I wish. The cream in statistics has not risen to the top. There is a multitude of awful textbooks out there that are used continuously because people insist on looking at that compute this because it's easy. It's much harder to talk about assumptions. It's much harder to talk about interpretation. And it has become a thing. And I really want the course to maintain that integrity of focusing on the science, both of the assumptions and of the interpretations, and essentially not doing rubbish. Um, in another course, I might have a completely different attitude. If I do the next course, which I think is the calculus-based probability course that I would love to be able to do, uh, I would be very happy to have people join in and insert things of their own. There's a lot of wonderful stuff out there. Uh, so what I'm saying is I would like to have the option to say yes or no to somebody being able to modify the course. And I think this is you know, uh, no derivative works. It's a standard kind of license. 
Uh, instructors, of course, are free to use any portion of it. They are free to assign uh, other texts as they wish, but I want this to be clear. And from edX, in edX there is, you know, when you edit uh, problems and solutions at the moment, the way it's set up, if you, when you edit the date of a problem, the date when it's due, uh, which you have to edit because you're running it some other year, the same screen allows you to edit the content of the problem. And so we tell the faculty member, you may not edit the content, but of course you have to edit the date. Uh, that's a software issue. I would like that edit button to just disappear from the content. Uh, and that will be very reassuring to me. Um, I'm acknowledged as the author of the course. This I'm sure there will be no problem. Uh, so instead of instructor, I would love to be called the author. And here is a killer. I own the copyright. There is, this has been said very nicely by Berkeley X and people at edX saying, you know, though now the faculty member owns the copyright, it is not a given by any means. Textbooks, there has been a long standing agreement between universities and faculty, the faculty who write textbooks, even though they've done it on university time somehow, it's their textbook. Online materials, not so clear. And what I would like is clarity. And I think this discussion has to be had Otherwise, faculty will not continue to produce materials. And that's one of the things you were referring to, who owns it, right? This discussion must be had. And I will, uh, what I find wonderful is that people have come, in, edX at least, has come into it with a very, uh, uh, it's a perspective that makes me want to continue producing materials. Armando here, one of the first things he told me, it's, it's your course, uh, he was director of uh, Berkeley X at the time. Uh, Anand Thagarwal, all of those people, but you know, they are not the only people involved, there are layers. There is edX, there is Berkeley X, there is MIT, Harvard, there is UC Berkeley, and everybody has lawyers. Um, and so all of those, that, 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 that does need to be clarified, that's a very serious thing. And my final uh, thing in my Bill of Rights is that money is getting involved. Licensing, syndication, all of that is getting involved. If money gets involved, what I'm asking for is a clarity of an agreement between the parties involved. Myself and my department and then edX and Berkeley X, all of those, plat those uh, entities that helped put this course online. I'm not saying what the agreement should be. I'm not saying it should all be mine. I'm just saying there should be one to which we all agree. Those are my four things that I want, and I think, I hope you will agree that that's not uh, rebellious, right? I, I, I'm not making big waves here. I'm just saying clarity. Now, uh, is this new? I don't think so. It is, again, familiar ground. We've done this with textbooks, and I believe we know how to do it. We just have to do it. It's not been done yet. So I'm encouraging a conversation on this and I would love to see this get done because this is a way of uh, keeping the MOOC project going, encouraging faculty to keep producing materials, reassuring them, uh, and uh, really making it uh, feasible, sustainable. So. Uh, here's an email address, shoot me an email uh, if you have uh, discussions, but I hope that a lot of the discussion will happen now. So I have a couple of things that I would like to address. We could just throw it open to questions. But I'm quite interested in two things. I'm quite interested in your views on what you would think about your MOOC. Would you be okay with other people teaching it? And if so, under what conditions? That is one thing that I would love to have a discussion on. And the other is, uh, what do you think author's rights should be, or instructor's rights. I mean, who, who, how do you think we should come together? This is, after all, an open environment. So what uh, is involved? Now, I'm, I'm going to say that this is being webcast, and so we'll do the usual thing of uh, questions into microphones. Shibani there is going around the room with the microphones, and so I see a question there, and we'll start with you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I can share an anecdote from Penn State. Um, we have a we've done two MOOCs that my department did uh, so, so sorry, far. What, what department is that? Oh, sorry, um, I am a director of an institute in Earth and Mineral Sciences, okay. the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. So we did one on mapping using GIS software and we did one on energy and the environment. 
Um, that's the one that I think is a close anecdote to share. It was authored by a Nobel Prize winning professor. Uh, he is a character. He is so wonderful, entertaining, but we knew in, in convincing him to do this MOOC that he would never have time to uh, be a, as involved as an instructor as we'd like. So we kind of set it up this way from the beginning. Um, and what we did was hired a, uh, a high school uh, geosciences teacher who had graduated from one of our graduate programs uh, in geosciences to be his, his course assistant. It wasn't a TA, he was, he was a partner, and he was the one from the very beginning, the first day the course was ever run, that was the front line of defense, so to speak, mm -hmm. in all the discussion forums. He was the one doing all the things you so nicely laid out. Um, he did have uh, the backing of this Nobel Prize winner. If there were things he ran into, he didn't, you know, he could, he could call upon him. And Richard Alley is this, mm -hmm. this Nobel Prize winner. And, and Richard, um, he, he ended up being more involved than he had originally thought he would be because he got so interested and so passionate. But it went super, super well. And I think the thing that was so interesting that gets at your question of do the students care or do they even notice? When I read through the, the remarks on the message, you know, on the discussion mm -hmm. forums uh, during the class and at the end when we did a survey of students to find out what they thought of this MOOC experience, they commented uh, so favorably about both the course assistant and Richard mm -hmm. as if they both had actively been involved in the course. Because having watched the videos, with Richard jumping up and down and you know it, acting certain things out and so forth, they felt like he was there, even though it was the other guy they were actually interacting with on the yes. discussion forum. So to them, it, they were both present, even though really Richard was not. If that makes sense. Yes. No. Exactly. That's why the, you know the the instructor, the traditional instructor, splits into two people, yeah. and those are very important people. There's a question there. One, two, and three. So okay. Is it my turn? <laughs> he, yes, the, the, this gentleman oh. up here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And then you, and then the person, the gentleman at the back. Yes. I, I agree completely that <clears throat> you should be able to have your own copy of the course. Yeah. Uh, and, and in some uh, workflows, that happens automatically. So when I, I taught a street fighting mathematics on edX, and that was all. Ah, that through. was you? Yeah. Oh, good. Loved it. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, that was all done through uh, LaTeX to edX. So yes. the entire workflow was LaTeX files and figure files written in asymptote and then compiled with a make file. Right. And then it was all uploaded. Terrific. When, so I, you when, can I, when, I, when I did Stat2x, LaTeX to edX didn't work well. Ah. So we had people entering things by hand into studio. Not a good scene. Oh, but I agree. LaTeX to edX would be perfect. Because that, that would solve that first problem. A absolutely, uh, completely. Then, you know, then I wouldn't need a copy. I would have mine. You'd have it you yeah, could absolutely. run it on a virtual machine. I, I couldn't agree more. A nice way of uploading would be terrific. Yeah, so I'm very glad that Latex to edX works. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, it, it, just to address that really quickly, if you're using Studio, I can show you how to export your course. <laughs> It'll export Great. the whole thing. No, um, I know. I, I know it does. Yeah. I, just, I just meant that it should happen as a normal thing. Sure, sure. Right, yeah. um, so just to give you uh, a qualitative analysis on the few things you talked about, about do the students care. So I, I was that second instructor. I took over Anant's class after he did 6002X. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and I, I, my qualitative analysis is, yeah, the students don't care that it's not the author in the forum talking with them. But I did still have the MIT PhD behind me. And so, and I think that did matter because when I was giving encouragement in the forum, it was a big deal that this MIT person was giving them feedback yes. and giving them praise and encouragement. Um, so I do think that is a big deal. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was uh, you mentioned about not changing the materials. So one of the things, like by the time I taught the class, I taught it for two terms. By the time I was doing it for the second term, I had students who had taken the class four or five times. So the material. Can I, can I, it's just just yeah. for me to understand why, why were they taking the class four or five times? Because now they were in the forum assisting the students who needed help. I see. 
I and I I was able to anoint them as community TAs. Mm -hmm. They had their mm -hmm. own label, and it was key because that's how I could teach thousands of students and not be answering all their questions. Yep. And I could be focused on encouraging them to do other things and to do outside projects. Um, but so it was kind of key for me to be able to update the materials because those students who were taking it for the fourth or fifth time wanted to see new things. So all of the exams were always new. Um, and I also tried to update the at least one problem per problem set every week. So um, I, I don't know if that fits into your model of not editing the material. What do um, you think of so, that? So as far as, far as I'm concerned, uh, as long as the set of materials that was originally provided is kept as an entity, any additions uh, can be done by the instructor. Uh, it's just the, I, I would like to have the option to decide whether or not the person can actually uh, insert things and delete things in, 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 a, in, a, in a given course. And so, you know, maybe, maybe what you do is, you know, what, what I have is in blue and what you have is in purple and it's very large type and it's very obviously different, maybe. But uh, especially if the course is going to be used in many different places with many different instructors, um, I, uh, I would ask that it be done sort of a little bit separately. So you can have, for example, uh, MIT has a probability theory course where uh, in an exercise set, every problem appears on its own page. Terrific. You add your own pages. How, Which, how would you deal with the exams? You can't have two exams. No, you just don't offer mine. Oh, because so that includes deleting, right? So that, Sorry? That, that enables you to uh, approve deleting your exam. Yeah, yeah, they can use any subset of the materials. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just don't want things inside No, 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 they don't have to do everything that I said you have to do, right? You can assign problems to A and to B and not to C. Why is that different than deleting? Um, as far as I'm, it's not, it's not deleting, it's choosing not to use, right? When I have a textbook, right, then the students can read the entire textbook and I will assign problems six, eight, and 14. The other problems remain. So that's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is uh, it doesn't go away, it's there. Exams, exams are private anyway. Right, so exams, exams are quite different. Exams cannot be seen by the student anyway until the moment the exam is uh, supposed to appear. So it doesn't appear, that's fine. The next person who gets the course gets the course in the form in which it was originally written. So thanks for drawing out the author versus instructor distinction. I think it's very healthy. Um, I, I'm a MOOC instructor. I have a, a course on Coursera, and I'm very proud of the structural integrity of it, right? From beginning to end, I know where everything is and why yes. every I was dotted and T was crossed. Yes. And it, I would never claim it's perfect, but it is, it is you know, my mm -hmm. body of work. What subject? Uh, programming languages and okay. computer science. Uh, let me just offer maybe a couple friendly amendments yep, in, in sure. a couple directions. Yes. So first of all, it's not necessary to divide everything up. It's incredibly healthy and to figure that out. But I think for many of us, and probably yourself as well, one of the things we love about being professors is that on any given Wednesday, we do 17 different things that need not be done by the same person. It is, it is part of the fun. Uh, and, and that's OK. And it's important to recognize this, these distinctions as, as, as we do. And then people have noticed in the MOOC space that, of course, you can divide things more finely, and, and different people will want to do things slightly differently. I imagine there will be some course authors that don't want to do the course management and the deadline setting and all that, but would actually really enjoy on a 10 minutes of day, pretty much for forever, as long as it's not mandatory, participating in the forums. It's their Facebook, it's their email, mm -hmm. it's something that they derive great personal satisfaction mm -hmm. from doing, and hopefully not in a way that gets in the way of what you're calling the course instructor. And then on the authorship side, you know, I, I have faculty I helped uh, organize a different MOOC on campus where one person did a, the videos and a different person did the homeworks. And it was a wonderful collaboration, and they, you know, and, and they both, you know, it wasn't quite co-authoring because it was a pretty different set of stuff, but maybe we would just call that co-authoring. 
Um, and you know, there's going to be a hundred variations of, I think, the very high-level distinction that you've laid out here, and, and I think that's healthy. I, I don't think you're proposing uh, a model, a distinction. You know, no, 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 the no, author no, does no, this no. and the and, instructor and, and, does you know, that. I, I have author and instructor singular, but if you look at any edX course, typically there is more than one instructor, right? And there may be more than one author. Uh, I just had it to stop cluttering up my screen with S's. Uh, but uh, you can certainly have more than one person authoring a course and uh, more than one person being the instructor. I think the person who does the administration and so on uh, uh, is an instructor, just like anybody else. They can be called an assistant. You can have very many different... What I wanted to... The, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that when I am not actually teaching the course, I don't want to be called the instructor. That is the point that I'm trying to make, right? And so one of the things, you know, we've seen uh, copies of draft licensing agreements and so on, and there's a lot of emphasis on using the name of the person who created the materials. And I say, great, use it. But call them what they are. Don't call them something that's nominal, if I can say that about a name. Uh, more. Thank you for the talk, that was excellent. Uh, I have a, a couple of, of quick questions. In your Bill of Rights, you write, have your own copy. Yeah. Um, given the position of some universities that the course is likely to be owned by the university and you own the content, do you think you might want to amend that to say, to have use of your own copy, that you can use it any way you want, or you just care to have a copy as opposed to if you move from Berkeley, you may not be able to use it elsewhere. Quite. I mean, I would love to have use of my own copy. And so I, don't, I think those four are actually linked. That if you, uh, once you have agreements about one of them, that, that will affect the other. You're quite right. Uh, having use of the own copy would be a good thing to do. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to manage it. Uh, not every university is going to agree. Um, so that's an important distinction. Thank you for making it. And, and this, the other part that was not in your Bill of Rights is the, I, I, I saw that you have if money comes into play, but right. that's really after the course gets marketed and yes. sold. Yes. But there is no request from you to get paid for the work up front, uh, which if you think about a university like ours putting together a course, everybody else is getting paid for the work, the production work, et cetera, except for the instructor. Uh, in many cases, but you didn't state that that would be one of the things. No, you, you know, want. I didn't state that because I had in my mind. So this is this is you know my uh, what I would want, and I think I can see how people would want that. Uh, the thing is, I've been in a department where so many of us have written textbooks, right? So many of us have written textbooks, and you don't get paid for that. That is something you do sort of off to the side, and you know one of the things we're doing, of course, we refine that textbook. Uh, through teaching uh, courses that use those materials. Uh, and so I am actually okay with developing a course sort of on my own time. It's been done a lot. That said, um, there have been uh, grants, Gates Foundation and so on, that buy out teaching time. So that would be good to have. Uh, I would like to say that I am not insisting on being paid for developing the course. Um, that is something that is for me uh, something that I do as part of my profession uh, in the same way that I could not insist on being paid for writing a textbook. But there's an, I think there's a response back there. I mean, it's a very healthy conversation to try to come up with a Bill of Rights, because, if you will, because I think the Bill of Rights is in some sense a, a superset of what any one of us might find really, really important. I, I'm with you. I developed my MOOC for zero dollars and zero cents. I did it for the love of the game, I like to say, and, and so be it. But unlike you, uh, I'm less wed to the, the single object structural integrity. On the MOOC platform, whatever platform I'm on, I'm adamant about that. But when a colleague at another university says, I'm thinking of using and adapting uh, some of your materials, I say, here they are. Do whatever you want with them. Now, I don't think, I, I think you should have a right not to do that, 
but personally, I'm okay doing that. So, you know, if, if, if other people feel that the compensation angle uh, is very, very important to them, even though it's not important to you or to me, I think that's a really important conversation for authors to have. Absolutely, otherwise we'll stop getting new materials, right? If, people, if, if, it, if it is not possible for people to develop them just for, uh, you know, various constraints, then uh, the enterprise will suffer. So yes, you're right that it is a superset. And my, my, my object today is not to write a list of demands, but to raise issues that have to be addressed, I think, for this thing to be sustainable. And so what I love is this conversation. Right, this matters to me, this doesn't matter to me. And for me, you know, the integrity of the materials, as I said, I would have a very different attitude depending on which course I'm teaching. I'm just hypersensitive about introductory statistics. And the reason for being sensitive is uh, there's a light shining on it uh, in the comments that are made by students. So tens of thousands of students, hundreds of comments. And the thread running through the comments, and anybody who's been in my course will attest to this, I never understood this till now. I took it as an undergrad, I took it as a grad student, I'm using it in my uh, profession, I never understood it till now. Well, why didn't they understand it till now? Because they did have a lot of people teach them. There's a reason for it. And so for that, that one subject, very subject specific, I am very sensitive. Uh, other subjects, I would be much more free. Um, more. Yes, please. Can I pick up on the use question? Um, do you want the freedom to, ab to be able to put your course on Coursera or put it onto Facebook or YouTube? So that's a very interesting thing. Uh, do I want the freedom to be able to put my course onto Coursera or YouTube? Uh, at the moment, I haven't thought about it. And at the moment, n no. Basically, what's happening, I think, is that the university or edX, somebody is becoming my publisher, right? And so more or less I'm going to have a relation with them which was similar to a relation that I would have with the textbook publisher. So if I published a book with Wiley, for example, right, then I couldn't go ahead and publish it with Chapman Hall or whatever it is. And so there would be that agreement. All I'm saying is that I want that agreement. Right? And I want to be able to, should uh, edX decide that they're going to pull the plug, uh, then that agreement is null and void, and then I would love to be able to do something with it, if I want to. So I'm not saying that I want to be able to use it under all platforms at all times. So I'm so, not sure I answered your question. No, that's good. So there are two things that come from that. Some of many of the, uh, the courses, their, their materials are creative commons. So presumably, you should be able to, to do whatever. Um, but the, the second part of viewing the courses, the platforms like publishers, um, there are lots of hands in that pie. So you would, need to, you would need to, so now we're talking about copyright agreements rather than here is a course that I produced for the love of it and it's Creative Commons and anyone can use it, but actually I don't have use of it. I can't, my hands are tied. I can only have this on edX uh, as long as. Yeah, but see, the, the, the issue there is I don't actually have a platform, right? So I have course materials. Somebody's got to put it up there for students to be able to use. Somebody's got to maintain those servers, make sure that the grading software works, and so on. So that, that entity is quite important. And so my agreement will be with that entity, whatever that is. So I can't actually say I would like to use, I would like to be able to offer the course what I can, okay, I, I'm done here, my computer tells me. Um, um, I can, uh, I can see myself offering the materials to another platform, but I can't see myself saying, here, I have a course, because I sort of don't. I have a whole folder of files. It's not something you can do anything with. So I'm not sure I've got to your question exactly, but Armando might have a point of view. He did have a hand up. They both work. Just to give a, a very quick institutional perspective, since I, I got embroiled at you know levels far above my pay grade on uh, some of these issues, Berkeley has a, a very unusual, very faculty-centric, very faculty-favoring governance model. And because of that unusual model, the factual answer to Ani's question is she actually does technically have the right to do whatever she wants with her course materials. 
Uh, Berkeley can, for all practical purposes, we cannot stop her if she chose to put her course on Coursera, to put it on Facebook, to put it up at one of these various sites that we're now getting emails from saying, we will monetize your course. Uh, so what we try to do is create uh, a culture and a set of circumstances that makes it clear that that's not the winning path. It's not the, the best thing for the institution, and then in the long run, we believe it wouldn't be the best thing for the instructor. Um, but I can sympathize with my colleagues and counterparts at other institutions that have quite different policies about who owns the intellectual property inherent in the materials that faculty members create. And if I were one of those people, this is one of the things I'd really want to get out in front of. Um, you know, as I said, at Berkeley, the decision's been made. This is, historically, this is how it's always been. My IP as a course author is exclusively mine, and the university essentially has no control over it, which is an unusually faculty-favoring point of view. Um, and you know, there are times when it works for us, there are times when it, you could argue it works against us. But if you're in this room and, and you are dealing with this at your university, get out in front of this, because there are people who are going to be approaching your instructors directly and offering them money to do things with their intellectual property, and this is going to come up if it hasn't already. That would help me understand why you say that. Did you do the course all on your own, uh, or did the university invest 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 to do your course, or was it mostly just uh, uh, do it uh, yourself? There was a, uh, we had a small Gates Foundation grant. It bought me out of one class, and it paid for some um, uh, engineering support. Okay, but then the a university very, a very, didn't... A very small, and, and, then, and then after that, I think the, the, the issue that I'm, I think there's not one answer, there are going to be situations like the one you described, but there are issue, situations where the university does make a, a, a claim on some of the work that's been done, and it will be very hard for you to take that, the work that the university has created and move it elsewhere without... Completely, I, I agree, and I have a lot of respect for the support that I've got from the university and from edX. Yeah. I should point out that it's 2.35, yeah. and those who want to leave can leave without embarrassment, yeah. but I'm happy to keep the conversation going for another second. Okay. Uh, just Armando. to clarify, um, although uh, Ani is correct in terms of the support that she got, but I can tell you that even if she had gotten full university support to do this course, it would not change the answer to the question. The university could and probably will have conditions such as we get the right to, essentially we, we, we become a licensee. You will license your course to us so that we can do various things to it. But none of that would inhibit Ani's ability to also do whatever she wanted with it. And at Berkeley, because of the way the governance model works, that would be true even if the university had funded 100% of the development costs of the course. But we're unusual. Yeah, that is a very unusual status. You don't take exclusive licenses? Not in general. All right, all, thank you so much. I'm around. Thank you for coming and sitting through uh, a, a, an hour. Uh, I would be very, very happy to talk to you. Uh, and thank you for all of those who participated. Most helpful for me for the next round. Thank you.